The story began with a group of masked men in cloaks, known as crusaders, standing in a circle with enchantments engraved on the floor below them. The first door opened, and one of the crusaders asked the others to recite the enchantments to initiate the summons. On May 14th in Japan, on a bright sunny day, a boy set out for school. His name was Kirono Mao. Kirono was a tough-looking but ordinary high school guy. He was on his way to school with a headache, and on his way, he ran into Shirohashi, who was his classmate. They had an awkward conversation, and she reminded him about their club activity that day. Later, they met in the club room, and Kirono was wondering whether she hated him since most of the time he didn't show any emotions. Shirohashi told him how they didn't have any activities and that she had something to tell him, and that is the reason why she lied to him about the club activity. Shirohashi, with an embarrassed face, began confessing. She only said I've always liked when something happened. Something happened to Kirono. He heard a voice that said pain and all of a sudden Kirono fell to the ground with immense pain. The voice was that of one of the crusaders. Whatever it was, it was hurting him a lot, and Shirohoshi wasn't of any help. She couldn't understand what was happening. Again, Kirono heard the voice, it said die. Kirono opened his eyes, and the first thing he saw were two crusaders with masked faces, long cloaks, and a cross embedded in their cloaks. Kirono couldn't understand where he was. He just knew that he was alive. He couldn't understand the crusaders' language either. He saw one of them bringing a ring the size of a head towards him. He wasn't able to speak, nor could he move his body. With fear on his face, he laid there like a statue. The crusader put the ring on his head, and he got unconscious. He woke up in a small chamber with the ring attached to his head. He saw an old, tall crusader with a long beard who seemed to him like the leader of the other crusaders. The old crusader, without wasting any moment, said die and Kirinono fell on his knees with pain. These were one-word commands that made Kirono do whatever the crusader said. The crusader then commanded him to rise and obey. In no time, Kirono was hanging in a large glass tube with dozens of injections piercing his body. The pain was unbearable, and Kirono couldn't believe that it was all real. After experimenting on him, Kirono was thrown into a cell. For many days, he was just a test subject for the Crusaders. All the painful experiments made Kirono numb. He could not even move his body, and he lost his will. One day, a couple of crusaders came to his cell to take him. They addressed him as number 49 which was the name given to him in the establishment he was kept in. This time he was not taken to a test lab but rather to an open space, like an arena. When the light hit his face, he thought maybe this time he would not be tortured. But as soon as he got inside, he saw what looked like an armored doll standing in the middle of the arena. Upon closer look, it was a robot dressed like a knight. An announcement was made that it was a functionality test for Kirono. He was commanded to use black magic to defeat all of his opponents. Upon hearing this, Kirono got frustrated about how he was used as a test subject, but before he could say anything, the robot knight charged at him with a punch. Having no time to react, Kirono took the hit and got thrown into a wall. Kirono twitched and got up. He realized that he had hardly sustained any damage. He was not sure whether it was the robot's weak attack or his strong endurance. The robot once again charged at him with full force, but with just one strong punch at his face, the robot fell down but wasn't defeated. They exchanged punches upon punches, and finally, before his last punch, Kirono's hands were covered with a mysterious black aura, which somehow gave him so much power that in one punch he broke the robot into two pieces. He won the battle, and before he could take a moment of relief, all the gates of the arena opened, and more robots came out of them. He was again commanded to use black magic to defeat them. After that day, Kirono did not have a choice but to fight every time he was thrown into the arena. If he died fighting, he would be forcibly revived. He knew that as long as he kept winning, he would survive. And to survive, he had to become stronger. With every fight, he learned something new about his power. Kirono understood that the black aura that overflowed during his first fight was indeed the black magic the crusaders told him to use. Kirono soon learned about his powers. By contracting the black aura, he could easily slash through his opponents, although he could not use it as a weapon or a shield. The crusaders even restructured his weak body to increase his endurance, strength, stamina, vision, hearing, and natural recovery. His body was no longer that of a human. He was not the normal schoolboy anymore. His body was now broader, taller, and bulkier. Among all of that, he still remembered the literature club and Shirohashi's face. He fought demons, goblins, dragons, orgs, and whatnot, and he knew deep down that he must survive before he was completely turned into a slaughter machine and that he must return as the person he was to the human world. One day again, Kirono was summoned to the battlefield, and when he entered the arena, he saw the same armor doll from his first time. 
He was confused, but soon his confusion faded away as he saw black flames on the armored doll's hands. It was a magic type. The armored doll contracted all the flames and let out one single shot, like a bullet. In that instance, Kirono realized that even he could do the same, and he too contracted all his black magic and hit the doll with one shot. But the doll easily evaded the attack with a shield. Kirono got closer to breaking through, and they exchanged punches, but this doll was completely different from the ones he had fought before. Kirono named his one-shot attack rifle and with every shot, rifle's power got stronger and more accurate, but yet he was not able to break through the doll's shield. Kirono grew angrier, and he aimed at the doll with all his concentration. With one final rifle shot, he was able to break through the doll's shield, and once it was off guard, Kirono, with his punch, punctured the doll's stomach. Out of the blue, the doll coughed blood. Kirono was shocked, as he didn't expect the doll to be a human. An announcement was made that experiment number 48 had failed, and thus the experiment ended. Kirono still couldn't believe that he was fighting a human all this time. He got near the fallen human and removed his helmet to find a dead Japanese boy just like him. The boy's eyes were sorrowful and sad. Kirono couldn't fathom the fact that he had just killed a human. This despair made him fall to his knees and yell till his lungs gave away. All the while, the leader of the Crusaders was watching Kirono from a balcony with a smirk on his devilish face. He addressed Kirono as the Black Devil King and was happy to finally see him unlock his potential. A stone-faced lady with long gray hair and a long robe, just like the Crusaders, was looking for Cardinal R's in the Sacrament of the White Establishment. Her name was Lady Sariel. Cardinal Ars greeted her, and they sat down for what seemed like a meeting with other crusaders. One of the crusaders updated them about how the Heaven's Army project was proceeding as per their plan. Experiment number 49, Kirono, who was there for just three months, showed outstanding abilities. They were planning to continue experimentation to further strengthen those abilities and create more of what they called the Heaven's Soldiers. While the meeting was going on, Kirono was finishing his final baptism. Their plan was to display the finished product in the holy city within one year. Suddenly, while the crusader was speaking, Lady Sariel took cover under the table. The others were confused, and as soon as one of the crusaders asked her what she was doing, they all felt a tremor, an earthquake. Lady Sariel was able to predict it. Cardinal Ars orders everyone to evacuate the building and to check the casualties. A crusader hurriedly entered the room as if he had some big news, but before he could speak, there was another earthquake. When the earthquake occurred, everyone was told that number 49 had escaped in the midst of the baptism ceremony. A few minutes before this, Kirono gained consciousness after the impact of the earthquake in the experimental chamber where they brought him for the final baptism. But because of the earthquake, the experimental chamber was a mess and the crusaders were still unconscious. Kirono's heart had already died once the day he fought and killed the doll, which in fact was a human. But after that, he killed many more experimental subjects, and slowly he could not feel anything anymore. He became just like one of those dolls. But all of a sudden, these thoughts came rushing to him, and he could not understand what was happening until he saw the head ring, which was always stuck on his head, fall to the ground near him. The head ring controlled and channeled his emotions and feelings, but now that it was no longer on his head, he had free will and could think like a human again. Although he wasn't sure how it came off, he knew that he was now free. He was laughing at his freedom when one of the crusaders woke up and addressed him as number 49. Kirono held his neck and warned him not to call people by tag numbers. His bottled up anger made him crush the crusader's head completely while telling him that his name was Kirinono Mau and not number 49. After the grim death, as he was leaving the room, another crusader attacked him from the back with an injection. Kirono thanked him for the care they took, and then he stabbed him back with the injection and walked away. When he left the experimental chamber, he saw a group of crusaders looking for him as the news of his escape was announced everywhere. One of the crusaders spotted him, and before he could inform the priest, Kirono jumped at him like a demon and killed him. Meanwhile, Cardinal Ars was sitting in the meeting room with a hand on his cheek and a grim smile on his face. A crusader asked him if it was okay for Lady Sariel to go before the most dangerous of all the experiments. Cardinal Ars replied that she was the only one guarding him, so obviously she had the potential. In fact, her powers were way too strong for any experiment to handle. Killing every guard and crusader on his way, Kirono was lost in the laboratory. He realized that he should have made one of them tell him where the exit was before killing them. He was surprised by the advanced technology of the black magic that was used to create a separate dimension that he was in within the shadows. He heard someone walking towards him in the alley. He turned around to find a woman in a royal dress, 
hair so long that it almost touched the ground, and a face with no expressions. He saw a big cross emblem on her dress and asked her who she was. Lady Sariel introduces herself as the seventh apostle. Kirono, without wasting any time, asked her the way out, which she refused to tell. Kirono understood that she definitely was an enemy, and he did not know what to do. He could not go back as there was no exit, and he could not kill a girl that he had nothing against. So the best option for him was to bypass her. He sprinted at full speed and bypassed her, but her one single attack threw him on the ground. Her power was immense, and she had collected a lot of magic power to attack at such a velocity. Lady Sariel told him that she would have to stop him right there, and her entire body started radiating magic. For a second, Kirona was terrified of her magic. He knew he could not go easy on her, if he did not counterattack, he would die. He attacked her with his anti-material shot, but before the attack could reach her, her kill shot beam threw him off balance. He knew that she could not attack and defend at the same time, but she easily caught his anti-material bullet with one hand. She found it interesting how he used a high-speed revolution to increase the power of the bullet, but Kirono was shocked that she caught it with her hand and read her attack at the same time. Her kill shot beam had made a hole in his thigh, and he could not stand properly. He had to escape and use all of his power to do it. He used his black flame attack to create a curtain of dark flame so that he could escape. He runs for the exit while taking multiple hits from Lady Sariel. He was looking for a place to hide, and he found one. Lady Sariel walks through the black flame without any damage, as if it did not exist. She found a well, and she knew Kirono had jumped into it. It was the underground waterway that directly connected with the stream outside the Sacrament of White. Outside the establishment, Kirono gets out of the stream, coughing. He had many wounds on his body from the battle, and he used muscular replenishment magic to seal the wounds by jellifying the magic. He did not want to fight Lady Sariel again. He took a look around, as this was his first time out since he was summoned. He saw an ocean and a ship and questioned whether it was a port town. He was sure it was not Japan, as the entire city was full of cross symbols. It was the Crusader's turf, and he could get in trouble if any locals found him. He saw a huge ship, which looked like a warship, and other small boats, which were for supply and provision. He knew nothing about the place, and he could not get away from it on foot. He had an idea. He sneaked on the warship and hid in one of the food boxes. The ship departed, and it was heading towards the Pandora continent. He lied down with relief and thought about all the torture he went through, all the killings he did, and infiltrating a boat whose destination he did not know. He was in deep sleep when someone nudged him. In his dreams, he thought her to be his mother, and he told her to let him sleep for five more minutes. He was woken by a splash of cold water on his face. He woke up to find himself sitting on the ground in a forest next to the broken food box he had previously hidden in. He was confused about how he ended up in that situation. While analyzing his surroundings, he saw a glowing, tiny, naked creature on its knees, covering its face. It was a pixie, shining blonde hair, pointed ear tips, and wings glowing in a rainbow color she looked embarrassed and asked Kirono whether he was alright. She told him that he fell from a cliff. Kirono put the pieces together and understood that the cargo boxes carrying him fell from the cliff while being transported, and he too was dragged with them and the pixie helped him wake up after he lost consciousness. He thanked her and thought she was the first person to show kindness to him in that world. He introduces himself as Kirinono Mao, and she found the title Mao intriguing and asked him whether Mao stood for the Devil King. He clarified by saying that it was Mao and not Mao. She introduced herself as Lily. They began to have a conversation when, all of a sudden, another fairy flew in and asked why there was a human and told Kirono to get out immediately. She also bashes Lily for being there, as false fairies were forbidden to come there. Kirono asked the fairy about what a false fairy was, to which she replied that there was no way that a fairy would have a body as big as that of Lily. She objects that Lily clearly is a half-human, half-beast, and also half-witted. Half-fairies were not supposed to be in the fairy garden to begin with. After explaining everything, she again asked Kirono to leave the forest and ordered Lily to take care of the goblins that were sighted living in the West Cave. Kirono got tense thinking about how Lily alone could eliminate those goblins, to which the fairy replied that Lily had magic and she could indeed take care of the goblins. The fairy yelled at both of them one last time before leaving. Kirono expected fairies to be friendlier, but that was not the case here. They both set out together in the forest. On the way, Lily explained to Kirono about the fairy garden and how there was a treasure of the fairy queen lying in the garden. All the fairies were born in the spring of light, where the treasure was kept and protected thus making it the most important place for the fairies. Lily was driven away from the forest when she was born, 
but she promised to protect the forest for everyone's sake. Tirono decided that he could not leave such a noble girl alone. He told Lily that he would exterminate the goblins for her. He assures her that his magic can take care of a pack of goblins and that she need not worry. They reached the goblin cave, and Kirono knew the goblins as he had already handled a lot of them during his mobility test. When asked whether they should kill all the goblins, Kirono explained that if there is one, then thirty will follow, so anyway, they will have to kill them all. Kirono began charging his dark magic, and he thought of trying a new ability, which he came up with while he was hiding in the cargo ship. The ability was to hold all the bullets and fire all of them at once. Goblins started rushing at him as soon as they saw him approaching. But he was not alone, as Lily followed him. He panicked when he saw her behind him, and he told her to be close to him. The fight began, and he used simultaneous release magic and shot multiple bullets at the goblins. Next, he used black and blade magic, which strengthened the weapons by coating them with black magic. Hirono could control the weapons without touching them. He did not have time to use it in the fight with Sariel, but he used it this time. He used automatic blades magic and sent all the powered up swords flying at the goblins. A tough looking goblin, much bigger than the others, carrying a big sword covered in magic aura, started attacking the goblins. Hirono thought the goblin had gone mad, but Lily explained that he was actually carrying a cursed weapon. The goblin charged at Kirono, and he attacked him with automatic blades but the goblin easily slashed through each sword in a single hit. Tirono quickly shot a huge laser beam at him, only to discover that it could not feel any pain. After the realization, Kirono took a deep breath, touched the goblin's hand with two fingers, and released a great amount of black magic that broke the goblin's hand. Tirono went ahead and picked up the black blade even after Lily's warning. The blade's darkness brought back a nostalgic sensation of hatred, killing, and death to Kirono and he understood that the source of the curse was indeed black magic. Hirono used blackened blade magic and coated the blade with his black magic to shut down the curse. Lily was amazed by Kirono's ability. Hirono explained to Lily that he could do it only because that thing worked similarly to his special ability, and she should not try it on her own. Soon more goblins came out of the cave and were ready to attack them. Seeing the huge number of goblins, Lily asked Kirono if she too could help him. Kirono agreed, and the fight began. There were much tougher goblins compared to the last battle, but after all the experimentation and test battles at the laboratory, it was easy for Kirono. He used his newly acquired blade, covered with his black magic, to slash through the goblins like butter. Soon, Kirono realized that the blade was losing its sharpness. This slowed him down a little, and he had little time to defend against the attacking goblins. Lily summoned an enchantment ring in the air, and a huge, bright beam came out of it, wiping out the goblins. Slowly, Kirono defeated all of the goblins, leaving only one. Seeing all his comrades dead, the last goblin was petrified. He could not even attack Kirono, and Kirono cut him in half from top to bottom. After looking at the bloodbath, Kirono needed a decent change of clothes. Kirono and Lily met and complimented each other's abilities. For the ones left in the cave, Lily created an enchantment ring again, but this time bigger than the last time, and shot a beam right at the cave, completely destroying it and killing all the goblins inside. Kirono was stunned by the level of Lily's magic. It was more terrifying than it was amazing. Like nothing happened, Lily turned around with a smile and took Kirono home. It was a small hut near a flowing river in the forest. She served tea, but only to Kirono. He questioned why she did not have tea, to which Lily explained that she only had one cup as no one came to her home, which meant that he was her first friend. Lily gets overwhelmed by this and hugs Kirono, leaving him stunned. That was the first day in a world full of hatred when he found friendship and someone he could trust. Lily and Kirono found a treasure chest. It was locked and they did not know what was inside. Lily told him that it was owned by a magician who used to live there long ago and asked him if he would open it. Hirono agreed and said that he too wanted to know what was inside. He touched the lock and it gave him a little shock. He realized that if he would not be careful, a trap would be activated. He used fortify magic on the chest and made magic flow through the keyhole. The treasure chest clicked open. They both looked at each other with delight. The chest contained a magic wand, a stained knife and the maid's robe. Lily asked Kirono to try the robe and he did. The robe looked good on Kirono and he felt that the cloth was thick and light and even had a faint trace of magic in it. Kirono remarked that with that robe he could become a magician. Soon they left for the next village. They reached the next village and were greeted by a lizard man. The lizard man told Lily that it was the first time she had brought a guest. They both introduced each other and the lizard man told him that he must be a good human because fairies did not befriend bad humans. He gladly let them inside the town. 
Hirono got his guards up, thinking it was an enemy, but in fact he was a villager. Lily seemed to be well known in the village, as everyone greeted her. Some even asked for favors like making more medicines. Lily took Kirono to Madame Mayor, where she showed empathy to Kirono and told him that they accepted human males in the village, and thus he could stay with them. Kirono refused the proposal, saying he could not stay forever at Lily's place and be a burden to her. Lily started throwing tantrums like a child and told him how she would be lonely without him. Madame Mayor requested that Kirono oblige to Lily's request because fairies do not say anything that they do not feel. Kirono explained to Lily how he is bigger than Lily and thus would take up more space, but Lily was desperate to live with Kirono because he was her first friend. Madame Mayor asked Kirono whether he had any job prospects, which he definitely did not have, so she sent him to an adventurer's guild, where, according to the mayor, anyone could find a job easily. The inside of the guild was a rather large space, with tables and chairs spread across it. On one of the tables, there was a group of what seemed like adventurers relaxing in the corner. Kirono looked around and found the reception's table. The receptionist was a cat girl who was complaining to her cat about the overload of work given to her by her senpai. As soon as Kirono approached her, just like a cat she jumped up. Leaving behind her sulkiness, she introduced herself and the guild to Kirono very cheerfully. Her name was Nierko, and she explained to Kirono how the guild works. Monster extermination, rare material acquisition, and dungeon exploration were a few of the activities that the guild usually provided to its registered adventurers. By completing the quests, the adventurers could earn rewards. She handed him a form, and thanks to the experimentation, Kirono could now use interpretation magic too. All the while Kirono and Nierko were talking, Lily was busy playing with Nierko's cat, which really did not show any interest in Lily. After filling out the form, Kirono received a guild card, and hence he was officially a guild member. Nierko asked whether he would like to go on a quest right then, but he refused. They found Lily sleeping on Nierko's cat, and Kirono lifted Lily on his shoulder and took her home. On their way home, Lily learns that while she was asleep, Kirono went to the inventory to get his cursed broadsword appraised. He told her the cursed blade story. Once upon a time, in a small village near the frontier, there lived a beautiful woman. She was the only daughter of the mayor, a kind-hearted lady who loved the village more than anything else. She was not only beautiful but also intelligent and skilled with the sword. One day, a young mage came to the village. He was an adventurer who came to exterminate a group of monsters living near the village. He went to the monster's lair with the village soldiers, but the cunning boss of the monsters led a surprise attack and sent them home in defeat. The young girl treated the mage, who came back barely alive. The young mage went back to the mountain alone to fight off the monsters, but again, he came back defeated. The cycle continued until one day the girl asked him to take her with himself. The boy obviously refused, but she insisted that she wanted to fight for her village. She also had a broadsword with her that would not be noticed easily. Won over by her passion, the boy let her come along with him. With their combined strength, they kept on driving back the monsters. After an intense one-day battle, they finally defeated the boss of the monsters. The boy was happy that he saved the village, and the girl was happy to see the boy happy. But no one in the village was happy, and they badmouthed the two. Even the mayor asked the boy to leave the village because he had put his daughter in danger. The boy sorrowfully parted with the girl. The girl was confused and enraged. Even after saving the entire village, the village threw the boy out. She saw the villagers as monsters and swore to never forget them. Her broadsword, which was fortified by the boy's magic, went on to slay the villagers without end. The girl completely went berserk and was blind to the boy's love. The first monster she killed was her own father. The girl gave him a smile that made his voice tremble. That is how the cursed blade with the remnants of love and hate was born. It was officially titled Cursed Blade, Slasher. The appraisal also provided him with more information about the other two relics found in the chest. The wand was a cane called Black Barrister, Replica. When used as a medium for black magic, the magic's power gets amplified. While Kirono was explaining it to her, Lily went and picked up the broadsword for a second, but the immense power of the sword made her dizzy, and she dropped the sword. Lily asked what happened to the boy and the girl in the story. Not knowing the ending of the story himself, he assumed that they lived happily ever after. The knife from the chest was called the Thumb of Ifrit, and before Kirono could tell more about the knife, Lily fell asleep. Meanwhile, in Holy City Elysian, the fallen chapel, Sariel, with her same stone-cold face, entered and was mindlessly walking in the aisle when someone interrupted her and asked her, did she pick the losing draw? He was Bishop Judas, the leader of the Crusaders from the Experimentation Chamber, 
and the one who actually summoned Kirono. Sariel sat down on his bench. The old crusader told her that Cardinal Ars did not allow the release of her full potential when number 49 escaped. She replied that it was adequate for the circumstances, and she always followed the cardinal's orders. But this was not the root cause. The root cause was that she intentionally let Kirono escape. He was not blaming her. He was surprised that she let her emotions influence her actions. She, too, was a human long ago, which he had forgotten. The real purpose of their meeting was to settle that according to their plan. He chanted a spell, and a ring materialized on her head, the same ring that even Kirona wore and that is able to control the emotions and feelings of its holder. Then he chanted another spell, which broke the ring and set her free. With that, there was nothing holding her back. He offered to kill him, as those who are freed from mind control usually try to kill their controller first. She was the second person to attain perfect liberation. She was free to go on any expedition without regret or trash the devil as much as she liked, but she chose to follow the oracle. She was confident that she would be successful in the invasion of the continent of Pandora. A giant Dordis was attacked by the Adventure Guild members. Meanwhile, Kirono was made to watch the veterans fight as he was a porter, and porters were not allowed to fight. There was a warcat, the lizard man, a half-snake, half-human girl, and a boy with a harpy. Two days ago, one fortnight after meeting Lily and settling down in his new life, Kirono was eating in the guild building when a warcat came to him and blamed him for getting too comfy with Nyarko who too was a warcat. He accused him of flirting with her and trying to get touchy with her. The warcat got enraged and soon snatched Kirono's collar, but before he could do anything, someone hit his head. It was a half-snake, half-human girl who introduced herself as Aiden and told Nino, the warcat, to stop screaming. She also introduced a harpy kid named Harry and a lizard man named Claydor. Together, they lead the Urz Bladers. They had an offer for Kirono. They wanted him to carry provisions. Urz Bladers was a rank 2 party, but in the next mission, they could level up to rank 3. She pointed at the steak he was eating and told him that the next target would be that. She further explained that it was monster Dordis meat, which is usually sold at a high price. Even its tusks, skin, and fur were expensive. But the problem was that the prey was too huge to carry, and thus they needed someone who knew dimensional magic. And Kirono was perfect for that role as he too used to store and retrieve weapons from shadows. He would be paid well even though he could not participate in the battle. He agreed, and the contract was done. Back to the fight, the Dordis was giving a tough time to the Urz Bladers. Constant attacks from Nino, Aiton, Claydor, and Harry were not enough to take it down. The Dordis targeted Aiton. She conjured her magic and attacked it with her eyes Chris Sajida, a powerful blast. But the attack missed and could only break a part of the Dordis tusk. Now Aiton was an easy victim of Dordis attack. She stood there helplessly. Kirono used anti-material using his newly acquired wand and hit the Dordis right in the head, killing it instantly. Everyone was shocked by the level of Kirono's magic. Aiton jumped at him and hugged him so tight that he fell to the ground. It had been five days since Kirono was away, and he felt lonely without Lily. As soon as he opened the door to their home, Lily jumped at him. As usual, she had no clothes on, but something else was different about her too. She was not a kid anymore. She was a grown woman with a huge breast, sensual eyes, and perfect curves. She was as tall as Kirono. He could not believe his eyes. For a second, he thought maybe she was someone else, but then Lily explained that there was a legend that every full moon night, the fairy queen traveled to that world on the night of the full moon. A fairy's strength gets multiplied by several folds each full moon night. The same applies to half-bred fairies like Lily. This was indeed Lily's real form. Kirono was shocked to know that the tiny form was just a temporary one. When Lily was separated from the font of light, she turned into a childlike form, and the same happened to her mental state and powers. This did not mean that she did not have any memories of her childlike form, she remembered everything. She persuaded Kirono to tell her more about him because, the first day they met, she knew Kirono was very hurt. Lily was reminded of an old fairy tale about a foreigner like Kirono when he told her that he had escaped from the Ark Continent. He asked Lily whether she would believe him if he told her that he had come from another world. Lily easily believed him because fairies can tell when someone is speaking the truth. Kirono wanted to return to his real world if it was possible. He had decided to live in this world. Lily hugged her and assured him that she would always be there for him. Although he could not read hearts like fairies, he could for sure feel her sincerity. He made peace with the fact that even if he could not return to the real world, he would be happy as long as Lily was by her side in this universe. Kirono abruptly broke free from the hug and asked her to put on some clothes because that was the first time he saw the true adult form of Lily, 
which was a little difficult for him to resist. Lily was covering herself using a fairy barrier, thus she did not need clothes, but to a human she was still naked. Hirono puts his cloak on her and she gets mesmerized by his scent. In that moment of embarrassment and palpable emotions, Lily asked Kirono to be together forever. She soon decided to put on some real clothes, but for that, she needed some high-end fashion. Lily's country was called Daedalos, and at that time the Cross Army, led by Sariel, was in the port city of Virginia. The king of Daedalos was Garwinair, a black dragon who held powers beyond the imagination of a human. He had always wanted to unify the continent but was never able to achieve it. He always lost to his neighboring country, Sparta. The Pandora continent, of which Daedalos was a part, was a land with many different species besides humans and had many dungeons unexplored. The Daedalos army was strong enough to send the Cross Army back, defeated. This meant that the Cross Army would not be able to take the capital easily. The snowy season was in July, and between Virginia and the capital of Daedalos, there lay a hill, the Hill of Gordolan. The army of Daedalos and the Cross Army were ready to face off. Daedalo's dragon army was soaring high in the sky, and the cross army's flag shone brightly in the daylight. Sariel stood at the front of her army with a tall staff in her hand. Against her, in the sky, there was a giant black, terrifying dragon, ten times bigger than the other dragons of the army. It was Garwinair, the king of Daedalos. He called out Sariel, saying that humans like her, who call themselves the servants of God, were expecting to tread over their land unpunished. Without wasting any time, he let out a giant beam from his mouth. Sariel rode her pegasus, and swiftly, using a Larux Aegis, she easily defended the giant beam using a huge magical wings shield. The battle between the two armies began, and while the others were battling on the ground, Garwinair and Sariel took their battle to the sky. They were both exchanging blows, and when Sariel was too close to Garwinair, Garwinair shot a huge beam, taking Sariel off guard. Sariel had to let go of her pegasus, but since she could not fly, Garwinair came rushing at her. Sariel used Sonic Walker and covered herself with black magic to levitate. She then created a giant ring of enchantments and shot a powerful beam, creating a hole in Garwinair's wing. He yelled and flew higher in the sky, and Sariel followed him and got too close. Taking the opportunity, Garwinair whipped his huge tail at her, breaking her Sonic Walker. She was falling back to the earth, and Garwinair, with pride, said that the skies are the dragon's territory and humans should fall back to the earth. Sariel was saved by her pegasus, and she stood on it with a strong aura radiating from her body. Garwinair was amazed by someone who could take his attacks and was capable enough to fight him. He asked Sariel's name, and she introduced herself as the seventh apostle. Down on the earth, the two armies were engaged in a bloodshed, but everyone stopped fighting and looked at the sky. Bright lights like lightning and sounds like thunder from Garwinair's and Sariel's battles beyond the clouds terrified everyone below. Sariel could not penetrate his hard scales, and Garwinair's body began emitting light, and soon his body was as bright as the sun, blinding Sariel. He roars and challenges Sariel for the final blow. He shot a humongous black energy beam at her, so strong that the air around the beam vibrated. Sariel created another enchantment ring which catapulted her at Garwinair's beam with full force. She used Moonlight Lunalux, a fast attack with her staff in front of her, which cut through Garwinair's beam. She destroyed his beam and stood near his face. Her reflection was visible in Garwinair's eye, and she used Bryonic, which created a thundering sound so strong that everyone was forced to look at the source of the sound, but all they could see was a falling dragon from the sky. Garwinair fell down from the clouds on the land with a bang, defeated. Sariel stood on his head with her sharp staff deep in it. She pulled out her staff and raised it in the sky to declare victory and the end of the battle. She was greatly injured, and she could not even open her left eye. The battle took its toll on her, and she whispered that she was not a human. Ten days after the battle, the cross army led by Sariel had completely occupied the royal capital of Daedalos. In the guild, Naruko was smitten by Lily's new dress. It was an ancient velvet dress. It was light, and it provided defense to the wearer as well as cold and heat-resistant properties. It was a rare enchanted item that was also able to adjust its size to its wearer. Naruko asked about the price since items like these were supposed to be expensive. Kirono was reminded of the shop where he bought the dress. After showing Kirono the ancient velvet dress, the fat shopkeeper also showed him the basilisk bone needle. It was a cursed item, and he knew that Kirono could use it as a formidable weapon. 
the tiny shopping spree cost Kirono his entire savings, which he had earned from his adventures. It was time for the summer arrival festival, and Nyaruko asked for his plans. The summer arrival festival was basically a large-scale cleaning to welcome the summer. After that is done, every single villager comes together for the festival. Naruko told Kirono that Lily every year attended the festival and helped the wounded and annoying drunkards by treating them. Kirono remarked that Lily is unexpectedly grown up for her age, and Naruko reveals that Lily was 32 that year and was way older than them. The small girl playing with Naruko's cat behind them was actually a middle-aged woman. It was surprising for Kirono because he was from a place where fairies did not exist. Therefore, he did not know that a fairy's appearance did not change after they were born. Kirono was struck, and he felt so many things crumbling inside of him after the revelation. Eruko asked him with whom he would attend the summer festival. Lily will be busy with her work. Hence, she proposes the idea of them attending the festival together. Kirono had no objections whatsoever. The next day, Nino was not happy with this. He bashed Kirono for saying yes to Naruko's offer. Nino's childish temperament made it easy for Kirono to gaslight him into thinking that he and Naruko would be together at the festival. Nino dashed out to earn more money before the festival so that he could take better care of Naruko. Kirono decided that he too needed to do some quests, as he had already spent his savings on the dress. While he was going through the list of available quests, Aiton sneaked behind him and startled him. He was looking at the quest that needed to investigate the Media Ruins new area. Aiton warned him that those ruins were really far away, and thus he should give up on that quest. She got a little too close to him to tease him and asked whether he was looking for a rare item like an artifact. Kirono explained to her that he was trying to find a way back to his hometown while reminding her that she was way too close to him by then. He did not immediately want to get back, as he had found another home there with Lily, but he had left his parents and friends back in Japan without telling them, and they must be worried about him. Hearing this, Aiton said that she had something she wanted to consult with Kirono privately. They settled down at a faraway table, and Aiton explained to him how everyone in her party had already become rank 3 and they had discussed becoming independent before going to the next stage. But the reason for Harry, Nino, and Claydor to become adventurers was to protect their village. But Aiton was the only one who wanted to become an adventurer because she wanted to go to the capital, earn contributions, and become a real adventurer. But now that she was alone, she felt really uneasy about going to the capital. Kirono offered her to join him and Lily until Didalis. Aiton was shocked because she was expecting people to make fun of her, but Kirono did not, and that made her cry. He further added that it would be more fun to go on adventures with her. Aiton felt relieved and left the guild, as she had to go shopping for her adventure. Hirono looked behind him to find Lily standing in her child form, wanting his attention. Looking at her, he still could not believe that she was 32. They set out in the forest, and Kirono wondered if they should go to the Media Ruins because the capital Didalis was really near them. While on their way, they found a witch sitting under a tree. A triangular hat, a black robe, and a long staff. She looked exactly like a character from a picture book. Lily thought that the witch was dead, but suddenly the witch stood up and asked what she was eating because it looked tasty to her. Lily offered the witch her ice candy, and in one bite, she gobbled it entirely. The famished witch looked a little satisfied. They later learned that she had fainted from hunger. Meanwhile, Lily began rolling on the ground and crying as her ice candy was eaten by the witch. Kirono gave her the last ice candy to stop her tantrums. The three settled down nearby, and the witch asked who made that delicious thing. Kirono affirmed and told her that she should rather have something more substantial than sweets if she was famished enough to collapse. He then asked her if she had any money on her. She had gold coins, and she pulled one out of her hat. It was Deed Ellis Goen coin and could easily provide her with a proper meal. She wanted to buy as many ice candies as she could once she knew that her gold coins were valid. Kirono was dumbstruck by the witch's gluttony and especially her hunger for sweet stuff. They had enough conversation, yet they did not know each other's names. They both introduced themselves to the witch. The witch gave Kirono her guild card from the guild she previously worked in. She, too, was an adventurer before coming there. Her name was Fionn Solo. Having a surname gave Kirono the idea that maybe she was from some kind of problematic family. He took a good look at her and noticed the good quality of the robe she was wearing. Even though she dragged people into her pace and had a bad awareness, her facial features were well placed, and she reeked of Ajusama aura. Although her overwhelming curiosity was the direct opposite of that of an adventurer's, she asked Kirono not to stare at her too much. She did not have anything delicious on her face, and even if she had, she would not give it to him. Kirono suggested that she should register at the guilds around her if she had planned to go on a long trip. 
she told him that she was planning to work as an adventurer in a town named Spada. The three bid farewell and went on their own paths, and Fionn promised that she would repay the kindness one day. Back at the guild, Kirono registered for the Media Ruins. Naruko wished him all the best and reminded him to come before the festival. Outside the guild, he met Aiton, Harry, Claydor, and Nino, and they too took a quest. Aiton told him that she would wait for him with a sorrowful look. Having the leader's intuition, Nino noticed a spark between the two, and he took Kirono aside and asked him if something was going on between him and Aiton. Kirono told him that soon they would go on a journey together, and he was cut short by Nino who assumed that they were a thing now, and he told Kirono to take care of Aiton with tears in his eyes. Kirono and Lily headed towards Didalus. Meanwhile, the capital, Didalus, was destroyed. Smoke, ash, and embers had covered the sky. On top of Didalus castle stood Sariel, with the same stone-cold face. An incident happened after Kirono and Lily departed from Ur's village. In a small village right outside of the capital, Dedalus, the roads to Didalus were closed. The guard received the orders a month ago to not let anyone pass. The guard did not know much and told them that they could get more information from the village's guild. The village's guild was run by a fat woman, who told them that the reason for the closed gates was the Battle of Gordolan. The woman spoke the truth as Lily read her mind, so there was no doubt about that. The Cross Army and the Daedalus Army fought not too far away from that town. But the problem was the fact that that information was hidden from everyone for more than a month which would not have happened if the Daedalus army had won the battle, as then the entire country would have known about the army's victory. This meant that the Cross army had won the battle and possibly taken over the entire country. Hirono and Lily decided that they would first ascertain the truth, then take a detour, and get to the capital. By evening, they had both reached outside the walls of Daedalus. It was a huge capital, with tall walls standing strong on all four sides of the capital, making it impossible for anyone to get in. The entire city was dark and quiet, which was unusual for a city of that size. There were no guards at the city's gate either. They closed up entirely, to the point where there was no need to guard the entrance. Hirono decided to climb the wall, as there were no guards to stop him anyway. He used shadow tentacles to create a long tentacle-like black magic with a pair of teeth at one end that easily hooked to the wall above. He quickly climbed the wall using tentacle magic. He found no guards on top of the walls either, he expected at least some soldiers patrolling. He caught a glimpse of something at the top of the towers, a flag with a cross on it. It was clear that the cross army had really taken over the capital. He punched the floor in anguish and thought about running to another country, but then he thought about the fate of the people in the village. Sooner or later, the army would reach the village and wreck it too. He did not know what to do, should he fight or run away like a coward, leaving behind those whom he cared about. Even the army led by the dragon king lost before the cross army, he had no chance against them. In his moment of despair, Lily reassured him that she would protect him from anyone, and she was determined to do so. Hirono hugged her and thanked her for her support. He decided at that moment that he would protect and fight for Lily and the villagers. He planned to return to the village and alert everyone before someone found them. He heard a voice asking him what he was doing there. He recalled the voice instantly. At the end of the path stood Sariel, caressing her hair. Her strong aura was radiating from her. She told them that Dandalus was under the control of the Red Army and entry was forbidden. She ordered Kirono and Lily to leave the place at once. Kirono was confused, as she was letting them go easily. She cleared his confusion by saying that her duty right then was not to capture him. He asked her the reason for the Cross Army's arrival on the Pandora continent. She explained that it was because their lord, the White God, desired that land. Sooner or later, all of the inhabitants of the continent should be converted to the Cross religion. She had already defeated the King of Daedalus, and now she was in charge of all of his territory. She was the current supreme commander of the Cross Army. Hirono turned around, hugged Lily, thanked her for everything, and, with all his strength, threw her far away from the capital in the forests. Before Sariel could react, he used bullet arts and hundreds of black magic orbs materialized around him. Using full burst he attacked Sariel with every orb. Sariel jumped up and dodged the attack. She was alone without a guard, which meant she did not intend to kill him, and on top of that, she avoided his attack when, in the last battle, she easily caught his magic bullet. She was not even defending herself, Kirono assumed that maybe she was injured from the Battle of Gordolan. Sariel had shown her weakness, and in that moment, Kirono knew that if he killed her, then the entire army would be in disorder. That was the only chance he had to protect everyone. He used sword art and sent multiple high-speed black magic blades at her. She hooked all the swords at the tip of her staff and attacked Kirono with her magic. She asked Kirono to obediently fall back. 
but Kirona was not ready to let go of such a perfect chance. He was ready to lose his own life to stop the cross arms. The battle continued. Both of them attacked each other and defended themselves. Kirono threw multiple swords at her, but she easily dodged them using her enchantment shield. After defending against multiple of Kirono's attacks, she jumped up in the sky and used Sajida. It was Kirono's magic that she replicated and attacked him. He barely defended against it and saw Sariel rushing at him with her magical staff. Kirono pulled out his broadsword. It was a cursed weapon, so Kirono told Sariel that she could not possibly destroy it with her magic. Sariel replied that if she breaks it then he will have to leave the place. He knew that if she used even half of her real power, then he stood no chance to win the battle. He attacked her again with sword arts, and while she was defending, he saw an opening. Her left hand was defenseless. Sariel had lost her patience, and she warned Kirono that he could not kill her. He brought out the basilisk bone needle, which he had bought earlier from the cloth vendor. It was covered in deadly poison, and if that poison was shot in her heart, no matter how much of a monster she was, she would definitely die. She pierced her palm with the needle, but she soon stabbed her palm with her staff, destroying the needle. She was amazed by Kirono's trump card. She used her same hand to launch one last attack of the night. Kirono fell to the ground. While leaving, she appreciated Kirono for finding something to protect, something so important that he would risk his life for it. Her powers had decreased after the Battle of Gordolin because she had recently restored her body. She would have to restore her left hand again. She noticed something unusual around her. The trees and the grass were dying. It was life drain magic, something where someone was absorbing all the life force. From the forest, Lily walked out in her true form. Sariel was amazed when she saw a girl being able to use life drain to steal the life force of the forest. She wondered who she was to be able to use such a forbidden art. Lily warned Sariel to back away from Kirono. Upon closer look, Sariel remembered that she was the same girl who was on top of the wall with Kirono a while ago. Lily went berserk and yelled at Sariel to back off again. She launched an attack that was so fast that Sariel barely missed it. Lily sat next to Kirono and checked on him. He only fainted. Lily lifted Kuro up in her hands and started walking away. Sariel told her that she would not go after her if Lily took Kirono away. Lily attacked Sariel again with tracking bullets. The bullets were so fast that Sariel barely dodged them again. But this time she cut each bullet in half. Sariel looked up and saw a huge enchantment ring that Lily had created right above her. In a moment, a gigantic beam hit Sariel. Lily carried Kirono to the depths of the forest, away from Daedalus, where he regained his consciousness. Lily was back in her childhood form. Kirono felt bad, as he wanted to save Lily, but she ended up saving him. She asked him not to be so reckless the next time because, after all, she was her partner. Kirono found her voice different. When she saved him, she returned to her original form using a certain magic that she reserved for emergencies and her consciousness was still in that form. She warned him not to fight Sariel again because he was lucky that she managed to save him and take him away, or else he would have been captured. Lily started crying, asking him to promise that he would not throw himself in danger ever again. Tirono promised her, and they began their journey back to Ur's village. In the middle of the crate created by Lily's magic beam, Sariel was protected by her magical wingshield. The guards came out when they saw the castle walls collapsing from the impact. She informed them about an intruder and told them that she had already taken care of him. She ordered the guards to strengthen the gate's defense. The guards updated her that the capture unit had complete control over the villages in the vicinity. Sariel assumed that Kirono's appearance meant that he had made his base in a nearby village, so there were chances of him encountering the capture unit. A few days later, Ur's village was attacked. Nino and his squad were helping everyone escape from the capture unit of the Cross Army. Nino went wild because they attacked a village at night like cowards. He slashed through the soldiers. Claydor updated him about the Vigilance Committee. They were resisting, but the enemy had quite a lot on their side. The old lizard man who guarded Ur's village was also dead. Aiton and Harry were protecting the guild because the people who could not manage to run were taking refuge in the guild. They heard a loud bang that came from the direction of the guild. Right outside the guild, Harry was badly injured. Aiton and Harry were surrounded by the capture unit. The leader of the unit addressed them as an inferior species who could not understand the absolute truth of the white god. According to him, they were demonic beings whose existence itself was evil. Aiton got furious, but the leader silenced her by saying that just listening to mere beasts speaking his language made him puke. He ordered his guards to purify them all. Just in time, Nino and Claytor slashed through the guards to protect them. Aiton informs them that Harry was heavily injured and that there were more injured inside the guild. That meant that they were the only ones who could fight. The leader got extremely furious at Nino and ordered the guards to kill the three of them. 
Fledor, Aiden, and Nino were surrounded by them from all sides. Nino dropped his sword and ordered them to surrender, as it was better than everyone getting massacred. Nino begged the guards to stop the attack, as there were civilians too. A fast laser passed by Nino and hit Naruko in the chest, killing her. The leader said that surrendering was an act reserved only for humans, and demonic beings were meant to be destroyed. Furious Nino got up with tears in his eyes, but a blast right at his face threw him on the ground, killing him too. A shower of arrows was launched at Aiton, but Claydor shielded her, taking all the hits, he too died. Aiton was surrounded by the dead bodies of her friends. Claydor, Harry, Nino, and Naruko. She lost her will to fight. Two guards stabbed her from the back. She, too, lost her life. The leader flinched, saying that it was unsightly to see those demons lying around. He wondered whether they prayed to the evil god or to the demon king. He raised his staff and commenced the holy war to demonstrate their faith by destroying the demon race. Hirono was running in the direction of Ur's village, with Lily on his back. They reached Kual village, the same village where the fat man who sold the basilisk needle, and the dress to Kirono lived. He informed Kirono that Ur's village was attacked, and the attack was so sudden that only a few adventurers could fight together with the vigilance committee. Only a few people could escape, and it was hard for him to say whether those who remained in the village were still alive. The capturing unit arrived earlier than Kirono had expected. From a distance, he saw Ur's village on fire, with smoke and embers in the sky. Lily noticed that the spring of light was burning too, and she had to protect it. They planned to go their separate ways and then meet up at Kual Village Guild. Hirono used his tentacle magic to climb the wall and get inside the village. As soon as he landed, the stench of corpses overwhelmed him. Ur's village was completely destroyed. There were guards everywhere patrolling. He could not find a single villager or a single corpse. He assumed that the villagers were captured somewhere. From a distance, he saw a few crosses put up in the central plaza. But when he got closer, he saw what was worse than a nightmare. On each cross, Nino, Aiton, Claydor, Naruko, and Harry's dead bodies were crucified. The view made Kirono sick and speechless. His eyes were wide open, and when he saw Aiton's severed tail lying on the ground, he puked and screamed until his lungs gave away. Two guards approached him, hearing the noise. Kirono's anger unleashed a strong, never-before-seen aura. He pulled out his broadsword from the shadows. His eyes were bloodshot red, and he looked like a devil with anger and despair in him. He attacked the guards. Meanwhile, Lily hurried towards the spring. She knew that it would be a problem if they stole Her Majesty's treasure. Something weird happened. All of a sudden, Lily's perspective changed. Lily transformed into her real form and no longer wanted to protect the place for the sake of those who drove her away. There was malice in her, a devilish smile, and evil eyes. She found it worthless to protect the fairy forest. The fairy who met Kirono and Lily when they first met in the forest flew to Lily and ordered her to deal with the large group of white men who were approaching the forest. Lily ignored her and told her why she should protect her in the forest because they drove her out of the forest because she was defective. The fairy yelled at her that it was a fact that Lily was half human, half fairy, and even if she was half fairy, it was her duty to protect the sanctuary. Lily spoke realistically and told her that there was no point in fighting them. Even if they defeated them, the Spring of Light would be attacked again by someone else. That was why she was taking Queen Beryl because the Cross Army's objective was to take over the Queen's treasure, so it would be better if she took it and put it to good use before the Cross Army arrived. The fairy got furious at Lily's logic and called her a traitor. Lily locked the fairy in her palms and asked her what she planned to do with a body and magic weaker than hers. Lily explained to her that by using Queen Beryl on herself, she could easily return to her true form every day although only for a short time, even outside of the sanctuary. She could talk to Kirono, the man she loved every single day, and nothing would provide her more happiness than that. The fairy was in disbelief upon hearing the reason. Lily plucked the fairy's wings and threw her to the ground. The other fairies were shocked to see something so gore happening in the fairy, and that too by the fairy herself. Soon beyond the lake, the cross army was visible, and they saw Lily levitating above the lake. Seeing her beauty, they assumed she was a goddess. Lily, with Queen Beryl in her hand, welcomed them and told them that she needed them to test out the power of the treasure. Before the guards could react, she created the biggest enchantment ring she had ever created and attacked the cross army. Back at Ur's village, Priest Kilvan, the leader of the capture unit that killed Nino and his friends, heard a commotion. He was notified about an invader, a black devil, who was rampaging in the plaza. The defense troops were losing to it, and the casualties were increasing. He set out to purify the devil by himself. When Kilvin and his guards reached the plaza, they saw the dead bodies of the cross army soldiers lying around and Kirono standing in the middle. 
Kilvin told him that he would crucify his corpse just like he did with his friends. Hearing that, Kirono lost his senses and jumped at Kilvin. They got into a duel, their powers were on par with each other. Kilvin had enough of Kirono's tricks. He used Lux Force Blast, a cleansing light attack that completely engulfed Kirono. Kilvin thought he won, but something hit his guard's head, killing him. It was Kirono's shot. Kilvin could not believe he was still alive. Kirono attacked him with his full force, but Kilvin used the Lux Argalia Shield, a shield made of light that was easily stopping Kirono's attack. Kirono had enough of Kilvin's blabbering and ideals. Only one thought was running through Kirono's head, kill and he put all his black magic in his broadsword and broke the shield. He slashed Kilvin in half. Having used all his energy, he could not move, and the remaining guards began shooting arrows at him to avenge their priest, Kilvin. He sat there like a statue while a rain of arrows was coming his way. Before the arrows could hit him, a huge wall of flames incinerated them all. It was conjured by Fiona Solo. In the spring of light, in Fairy Garden, there stood a huge crate as wide as the forest. Cross Army's soldiers were stuck in the crate alive. It was all done by Lily. She had used Meteor Strike which was amplified using the Queen's Barrel. After destroying the forest, she headed back in Kirono's direction. She saw a huge pillar of fire rising from the ground. She knew Kirono could not use such flashy magic. Back at Ur's village, Kirono was thankful to Fiona but asked her what she was doing there. She told him that she was there to meet the ice candy guy. She used her magic to heal him, and he told her that it was dangerous to be alone there. She was not alone, though, because she had brought a group of adventurers with her. They all looked powerful, an assassin, a werewolf, a skull man, and plenty others. Seeing them, the cross army guards withdrew, but the adventurers did not let them escape, killing every one of them. Fiona advised Kirono to rest up while she would take care of things, but someone interrupted her, telling her to stay away from Kirono. Fiona backed away. It was Lily. She thanked Fiona for saving Kirono and said that she was faster than she had expected. She asked whether the flame pillar magic was hers, to which she replied yes. Lily noticed that Fiona did not look tired. She would not have noticed if she did not look from above, but that magic was neither complex high-ranked magic nor wide-area magic. It was just a low-ranked Igni's shield. But still, if Lily tried to do the same in her true form, she would not be able to show such tremendous power. She knew that it was pretty dangerous to keep Fiona alone. She offered her as many candies as she wanted, and in return, she wanted her to be their ally for a while. Fiona got too close to Lily and told her not to break the candy promise. Fiona asked how she knew that Fiona loved candy. Lily revealed that she was with her when she met Kirono. It was her magic that transformed her appearance. Back at the guild, Kirono had woken up and asked Fiona how long he had been unconscious for. Lily was fast asleep next to him in her baby form. He asked what happened to the village and whether there were any survivors. Fiona told him that there were almost none and that the other adventurers had started evacuating the few survivors to Kual village. Kirono missed Nino and his group and held him responsible for not being able to protect even a single one of them. Fiona told him that after the evacuation, they would start the victim's burial. Right next to the guild, the burials were made. They all prayed, and Kirono put out flowers. Yaruko's cat saw it all from a distance with sadness in its eyes and then walked away. The remaining people left the dead town behind. Lily asked Kirono for the plan. They were to follow the evacuated, and the escort quests would be out soon. Lily told him that it would be reasonable for the evacuated people to head to Sparta in that situation, since they would feel insecure knowing that Daedalus itself had fallen. In that case, the adventurers in the vicinity would participate in the escort as well. The high-ranking adventurers who rushed over already numbered more than ten. That area was rural, but if all the adventurers gathered there, then there would be hundreds of them. But in that case, they would need someone to lead them. Lily happily pointed at Kirono. The werewolf walking ahead told me that no way in hell would a rank one like him be able to do that. That kind of stuff should be the responsibility of a veteran of the highest rank. The skull man added that rank and experience were important, but there was a simple, unwritten rule in Daedalus. The country prioritized strength more than anything else, no wonder they kept losing to Sparta. Lily explained that when the quest is announced, there will be a duel for the position of the leader, and she did not want to follow a leader who would not understand the threat the cross army posed, so she begged Kirono to lead them. Kirono had no experience being a leader, so he asked Lily to help him. Fiona interrupted him and told them that her hunger was at its limit. Lily told her that she had a lot to explain, but unfortunately, she did not have much time with her true form's consciousness. Hirono realized that she was able to return to normal, which was strange. Lily gaslighted him by pulling out Queen's Barrel, and she added that the fairies and she desperately fought against the cross army at the Spring of Light, 
and managed to push them back. However, in exchange, the spring fell into ruin and even the highness lost her blessing. They entrusted Queen Beryl to her as she fought selflessly against the cross army. Tirona was smitten by Lily's lies. Before losing her true form's consciousness, she left the rest to Fiona to handle. Tirona only had one ice candy, and he gave it to her and told her that he would make more of them once everything settled. For some reason, being with Fiona made him feel exhausted. She barely used her head to think. A few days later, in Kual village, a notice was released, and it was decided that all the villagers would be evacuated to Spada in order to escape from the force who named themselves the Cross Army. The adventurers were supposed to stay back and push the enemies away so as to buy time for the evacuation. Neither the reward nor the frame had been decided, but since it was an emergency, the adventurers were requested to participate sincerely. Meanwhile, Vulcan the werewolf had decided to lead the quest, and whoever had a complaint should come to him. Nobody stood up against him except Kirono. Vulcan was glad that he wanted to lead the quest because Vulcan surely would not go easy on him. They buckled up for their fight. Vulcan said that he would not move until Kirono attacked him first, as it would be a shame if a magician did not get to use his magic. Kirono, without wasting any time, used bullet arts and pushed Vulcan away with the attack, and then he used a full burst to send Vulcan crashing into the wall. Vulcan twitched and got up, he found it a good show, and too much fan service. He was amazed by Kirono's power. Kirono was stunned when he saw that Vulcan did not take even a single scratch from his attacks. He knew he would have to go full out to win the fight. Vulcan glared at him with his beastly werewolf eyes and pounced at him with his sharp claws, giving Kirono no time to react. At Kual Village's Adventurer Guild's lodging, Fiona entered Lily's room as she wanted to talk about something with Fiona. Lily asked her whether she would join her party. Fiona asked if she was referring to the two-man party of her and Kirono. Fiona was getting on Lily's nerves, and it was evident to Fiona. Fiona had the capacity to get on anyone's nerve without even trying. Such was her character. Fiona refused the offer, saying that she was not suited to be at a party. She had never been a member of a party for more than three days. She had often been dismissed in the middle of her quest. Lily knew for a fact that she was extremely bad at magic control, and that was the reason why she was driven out of parties. Fiona asked her how she knew that, to which she replied that when she saw the firewall that she created to protect Kirono, that was the first time she saw someone cast such a flashy shield. Without coordinating with her teammates, that power would have turned anyone into ashes, be that an ally or a foe. Lily told her that she knew that Fiona had been through a lot, but she wanted her to leave those conflicting feelings behind. She even valued her outrageous magic to the point that she wanted her close to them as a team. Lily knew that Fiona was from the Ark Continent because the guild card she showed them before belonged to the Ark Continent. She offered Fiona again to join her and Kirono, as they were strong enough to partner up with her. From there on, they would be going against the Cross Army in order to save the villagers. Fiona agreed because she too could not see the atrocities committed by the Cross Arms. As an adventurer in Pandora, it was her duty to cooperate in the emergency quest. She revealed that she once used to be a mercenary for the Cross Army. However, she did not plan to return as the food was not delicious. Lily understood her resolve, deemed her worthy of her trust, and hoped the same from Fiona. Lily made the situation more enticing by telling her that there was this confectionery named Pudding in Kirono's country, and the name itself made Fiona drool. She bribed her by saying that she could taste those delicacies one day if she chose to follow them. Before going to sleep, Lily reminded Fiona with a fierce look on her face that the number one rule would be that there should be no romance within the party. Meanwhile, Kirono and Vulcan were dueling. Kirono could easily counter Vulcan's attack from a distance. He knew that his range was shorter than Vulcan's, so he dodged his attack and used Pile Bunker, which turned his hand into a black magic drill. With one shot, he defeated Vulcan. Kirono became the leader of the emergency squad, with no one to duel against him. Everybody began cheering for Kirono after he showcased his promising skills. He went to Lily's room with some food supplies and found Lily sleeping and Fiona sitting next to her. Fiona asked her about pudding, and he promised her that he would make some after things settled down. She also informed him that she was now officially a member of his party. She assured him that she might burn both her allies and her foes with her magic, but she could not refuse Lily's passionate invitation. They needed a name for their party. For that, they had to choose a common point that joined them all. Fiona explained to Kirono how she did not have control over her magic. If she cast a normal fire spell, its effect would still be magnified. She could probably burn both her foes and allies alike. She could cast intermediate class spells of every element except light and dark, which Lily and Kirono already possessed. 
This made their party one of the few parties to have control over all the elements. If one could use all the elements, they could call themselves element masters. It was the dream of every magic user to be called this. Since their party could control all the elements, they named themselves element masters. Soon, Kirono had a formal strategy meeting for their adventure alliance with the other adventurers. He introduced himself as Kirono of Element Master. There were three rank fours, Vulcan, Moslin, the Skull Guy, and Saus, the half-masked assassin girl. He asked for their opinion, and Vulcan sighed and said that strategy meetings were only held within parties with a degree of trust, directing the mishmash should be on the leader's judgment. Kirono said that he did not have much experience as he was just a level 1 adventurer. Vulcan freaked out at the revelation, and when Kirono showed him his iron plate, which represented the lowest rank, he sulked and sat in a corner, embarrassed about how a newbie finished him in one punch. Moslin suggested that, in that case, they need to lend their wisdom to their new leader. Saus too did not have a problem because, according to her, he had already proved himself in the duel. Vulcan, too, accepted his defeat and was ready to support Kirono. And so the meeting began. The quest was meant to buy time for the evacuation. Usually it was plenty just being behind the refugees. But if they did that, it would be difficult to stop the cross arms. Vulcan exclaimed that they call themselves the cross army, but they really are just another cowardly human force. Kujoro explained to him that the ones they fought were the ones left over from Lily and Kirono's battle. On top of that, they had just lost their priest, and the chain of command had collapsed. It was difficult to scale their real power, as Daedalus lost after fighting them head to head. They could not counterattack from QL village, even though it had stone walls on all four sides, because it would be difficult to defend the village from all four sides on even ground. Hirono came up with a plan. The plan was that they would abandon Kual and then set up a line of defense at Alsace village, which was just before the border. The village was in between a large river, so crossing that would be difficult for the enemies. Moslin advised that it would be better for them to head towards Alsace as soon as possible. Kirono had something to do at Ur's village before heading towards Alsace. He had to execute the scorched earth tactic. Since they had invaded from across the sea, their supply line was not that big. The cross army would surely make Ur's village a base in the middle of their advance. Before they would do that, Lorono and his team needed to destroy all the goods that remained. Food, weapons, medicine, large facilities, everything of value to the military. A delay in supply would result in a delay in advance. They reached Ur's town and burned everything that had value. They even burned the guild, memories of the guild, and Nino and his squad came rushing to Kirono. He bid them one last farewell. Fiona burned the food warehouse, and the incineration went smoothly thanks to the large amount of oil in it. It was noon, and Fiona's stomach wanted food. After updating Kirono, she went in search of her lunch. All the while, Sao stood behind her, and he did not notice until she began updating him. Kirono was startled by her impressive skill. She updated him on the presence of the cross army on the mountain road. They were around 34 in number, and they looked like scouts. He ordered her to monitor the enemy for a while longer while he would inform the others. She asked about the plan, and he said that they would deal with all of them there themselves, leaving none of them alive. South suggested that he at least capture one of them alive. In the former Ur's village arrived the scouts, which South had informed her about. In front of the scouts was a girl with ponytails who was not older than 16. She held a bow in her hands and was the only female in the entire group. The smell of burnt goods was strong, and the atmosphere was smoky because not long ago everything was burned by Kirono and the adventurers. The general warns the girl not to loiter around, as the place is not safe. She carried her cat, Sumaki, with her. The place looked terrible, with nothing left but burned wood and broken houses. They could not make it their base anymore. The girl kept blabbering, and the general scolded her for bringing her cat with her. Her name was Owl. The general could not understand why the top management sent a newbie with them. One of the guards saw something flickering on the roofs. It was Lily. Al got excited about the rare sight. Lily raised her finger, and a shiny, bright light hit one of the guards. It was an attack, they were ambushed. The general ordered the troops to fall back and retreat, but a huge stone wall was resurrected at the exit. A smooth magic wall resurrected at the entry, capturing everyone between the two walls, and soon the hidden adventurers and warriors came out, ready to attack. The general told his army to calm down as they had a number of advantages, but things quickly went south as they were overpowered. Seeing the condition turn worse, Al ran away with her cat to hide. Vulcan confronted the general, and after a fearsome duel, he slashed him in half with his claw. 
he walked out without a single scratch, while the general lay there in two pieces. Hirono, too, went berserk and slashed through the men using his broadsword. One of the guards identified him as the devil. He used Kiranagi, which was an art where the Nagi's destructive power was replaced with black-colored mana to eliminate the guards. He saw Al escaping and running away. He closed her off in a corner and told her to surrender quietly, and he would guarantee her her life. She mocked Kirono, saying that she had gotten herself involved with a dangerous-looking Oni chan Al figured out that he had some kind of principle where he did not raise his hand against little girls. She threw something up in the sky and ran away, dodging the broadsword. It looked like a grenade but was a flashbang. She climbed the stone wall and threw another bomb. This time it was a smokescreen. He used a full burst, but the haze deflected his attack. By the time the haze cleared, she was standing at the top of the stone wall. She bid him farewell and jumped to the opposite side to escape. Fiona was mumbling some spells, and the mana on the other side was swelling. Al felt some kind of heat coming from somewhere. Fiona continued reading her spell, and soon the land started rumbling, and Kirono put up a shield in time because Fiona had used Igni's Chris Sagitta. A huge whirlwind of fire emerged, as hot as a volcanic eruption. The power was so strong that it broke Kirono's shield and sent him flying. It would have injured Kirono had he not sensed it beforehand and put up a defense. Fiona's Terra shield was obliterated in the blink of an eye. Fiona checked in on Kirono, who, luckily, was safe. She was sorry for dragging him into the mess, as it was stronger than she had imagined. Kirono was not angry at her. Instead, he was happy that he could expect more from her in terms of her firepower. Vulcan updated him on the situation. 33 out of 34 people were annihilated. Kirono clarified that one of them was burned to nothingness. Saus updated that there were no casualties, as no fools around there would have taken hits from small fries like those. Although they could not secure a prisoner, they were successful in destroying all the resources. Kiro could not understand how Al could have fun in such a tight situation. Far away on a hill, Al was chilling. She was amazed by Pandora and the devil, Onii Chan. She wanted to play with him for a while longer, but alas, she had to escape. But she made sure to have fun the next time she met Kirono. At a village on the border, at the Cross Army's temporary base, Al was reporting to the head priest. The head priest, Knowles, was mad at Al for escaping on her own without a single shred of shame. He was a broad, bald man with fearsome, narrow eyes. Al, not able to understand the gravity of the situation, was playing around, which made the head priest even more angry. She was complaining about how she did not have a good time because she was attacked by the fairy and the devil, Onii Chan. She asked to be praised for even escaping the turmoil. A sister stood behind the head priest. Her name was Sylvia. Miss Sylvia told the head priest to calm down as Al and the other mercenaries were supplied to them by Cardinal Mercedes, and saying something offensive to them might offend the cardinal himself. Al was a member of the Cyprus mercenary group, and Knowles questioned what values these useless mercenaries could even provide them with. He wondered if Al might be the cardinal's favorite. Meanwhile, Al got next to Sylvia and poked her breasts, asking how she got them so big. This pulled Connell's last string, and he threw Al out of the room, together with her cat. Before throwing her out, he ordered her to invade Ur's village with the main unit and bring those shitty brats along with her. At Kual Village's Adventurers Guild, the adventurers were celebrating. Vulcan was drinking and boasting how the cross army was just a small fry to him. Kirono and Lily were silently eating at a corner table. Vulcan appreciated Kirono's spirit. While everyone was eating and celebrating, Fiona told Kirono to come to her room later, as she had something to tell him. Later that night, as Kirono entered Fiona's room, she stood there, pointing her staff at him. The aura in the room was dead serious. She apologized to Kirono for pointing her staff at her, but it was for caution's sake. She said that Lily already knew about it and he should know that too. She revealed that she was a human from the Ark Continent. The continent is where the cross arms came from. She asked whether Kirono detested her and wanted to kill her. Kirono settled down and assured Fiona that he would not harm her. She told him how, after graduating from a magic school in Ark called Elysian, she had no place to go, so she sometimes joined expeditions to Pandora as a mercenary. She stopped it because employment as a mercenary was insecure and the food was not good either. Although she would not be considered a traitor as she went through the proper procedure, in the first place, she was not a believer in the cross. She therefore was not against hostility towards the cross army whatsoever. She was just like Kirono, a traveler from a faraway land. Their countries, beliefs, and races might be different, but she requested that Kirtono consider her as a person without a single thing binding her. Kirono asked her if Lily had told her about him. She said that she had only heard that he had come from a faraway country. He trusted her as a human and also because she was a part of his party. 
She confessed that she had killed quite a few people during the invasion of Didalis, but Kirono did not judge her, as he too was a killer, and above that, Fiona was doing her work as a mercenary. She thanked him for accepting her real self, and he told her about his past. At the castle of Didalis, Sariel opened a gate and welcomed three lady apostles, Missae, Mariabel, and Lady Mayachul. Missa was a short girl, Mariabel was a shy and awkward woman, and Lady Mayachul looked like a saint. They exchanged greetings, and Lisa ran and hopped on a couch. Nisei, looking at Sariel's state, remarked that she must have gone pretty wild in the Dragon King's subjugation. Lady Mayachal saw the bandage on Sariel's hand and, with a whip of her finger, healed it instantly. Missa asked who gave her that injury since the Dragon King's injuries should have been long gone by then. Sariel did not reply, which made Missa grin at her. Missa accused her of hurting herself with her own holy armament because she herself did the same thing a few days ago. Sariel was confused by Missa and Mariabel's high spirits. On the 25th of the first month, hundreds of adventurers from all over Didalis had arrived at Alsace, a village near the country border. Kirono, Lily, and others also arrived and were welcomed by Irina of Three Hunt Princess. She wanted him to explain the defense plan to everyone. Kirono was not sure about the shabby guild being their base, but they did not have many options to begin with. They needed to reinforce the village's outer walls too, but they lacked the resources. Expanding just the front of their fences was their limit. Kirono had something to tackle the problem with. He had brought barbed wires that would be coiled around the fences and would be enough to stop soldiers with light armor. The best use of them would be to obstruct the cross armies climbing over the fence. But the barbed wires were limited, and making them would require really intricate workmanship. If they marched at a reasonable pace, they would be there within a week, and he did have Vulcan prepare something just in case of an emergency. Kirono looked tense because Alsane was the village where Irina was born, and now it would be turned into a battlefield. Irina told him not to be sorry because, anyway, sooner or later, Alsace would be invaded by the Cross Army, creating something with her magic. Meanwhile, Lily was creating something with her magic in her room with Fiona's help. Fiona realized that Lily's child form was completely different and so cute. Lily was creating Fairy's Spirit Drug, a medicine where a small amount can completely heal injuries. Fiona was amazed by Lily's well-roundedness. On top of being an excellent fighter, she could also create medicines. She wondered if, if she was good at healing magic, people would appreciate her more. But she brushed away these thoughts because Lily and Kirono appreciated her magic, although it was out of her control, and she nearly killed him. Outside adventurers were putting up barbed wires around the fence. Outside the guild, Kirono and Moslin were planning to strengthen the guild with black magic. Kirono asked how the preliminary arrangements were going, and Moslin told him that it would take half a day at least. Setting elementary boost and eternity took some time. Moslin unleashed his true power and began fortifying Alsace's line of defense. His dark aura radiated from him and around the guild too. Al was eating field rations, a black, hard, and dried bar that contained the bare minimum of nutrients and was tasteless. A sly man and two guards approached her. His name was Cyprus. Al bashed him for distributing something so tasteless and told him that if he did it again, then a riot would break out. Cyprus reminded her that the entire village was burned down and they barely had anything. Al asked him angrily to ask the army for their leftover food, but he told her that his pride would not allow him to bow down for food towards those old men. He told her that he had kept some good food aside for himself, and if she wanted it, she should come over to his place at night. Al slapped him and told him to look somewhere else if he was thirsting for a body. He told Al not to be so cold to him, but she walked away, telling him to do something about the food since he was the leader. He was frustrated that the demons neither left food nor any woman behind. While walking away, he punched one of his guards. Back at the guild, Kirono used blackening to fortify the guild and increase its strength. Moslin's eternity and element would make sure that the effects lasted longer as well as strengthen them. This task would have taken several days and several sorcerers, but thanks to Kirono's special body, he could easily do it alone. By the time he completed fortifying the entire guild, it was already dawn. He went inside and heard a lot of commotion which was unusual for that time of the day. Someone was yelling, and upon closer look, it was a man in armor who was questioning the evacuation plan. Irina explained to him how this was part of the bigger plan, and that damage to certain bases was unavoidable. Hirono approached her and asked her what was happening. 
she explained to him that the man was Kual Village's vigilante corps leader. He was furious because he thought that the reason they went out of their way to take up camp in this village on the very edge of the border was so that they could escape to the Galahad mountain range on their own as soon as it got dangerous. Hirono explained to him that they were currently preparing as much as possible in order to intercept the cross army. Until the evacuation was complete, they would, for sure, stop the enemies in their tracks. Hirono had enough of the man who was still shouting at him. Even after Irina had explained to him the entire plan with cordiality and civility, Hirono grabbed him by his collar and told him that there was no reason for them to heed the instructions of an outsider like him. After all, they were only accepting quests of their own free will. The man called them filthy adventurers who were really easy to see through as they spoke nice words, but deep down, all they had in their tiny minds was money. Kirono warned him that if he wanted to order them no matter what, he should try defeating Kirono in a battle because adventurers only took orders from strong leaders. Kirono crushed a table in anger, which frightened the man so much that he left blabbering. Following him, a woman who looked just like Irina also walked out, apologizing to Irina for causing trouble. Irina told Kirono that she was her sister and a former member of three hunt princesses. She was currently in the Vigilante Corps of Alsace, but because Kual Village's union is larger, the Vigilante Corps obeyed its leader. In the evening, a young boy with a bag and a gun on his shoulder returned to Alsace from a quest. Everything had changed for him. There were so many people and so much commotion around. Most of them looked like refugees. He reached the guild and was shocked to see the black color. He entered the guild to find it crowded. He looked for the receptionist for some answers, but the reception was closed temporarily. He went and sat down in a corner. Hirono, standing like a creep over him, asked him whether he was an adventurer on a quest because he had never seen him before, and he asked whether the weapon he was holding was a gun. Hirono was surprised to see a gun in this world. The boy explained to Kirono that his gun had no magical mechanism but rather used iron bullets. The boy himself had invented the gun and was shocked to see that Kirono knew so much about his invention. Kirono was amazed at how a boy so young was able to invent a fully working gunpowder gun. The boy took Kirono to his cramped room and explained how the gun actually worked. He introduced himself as Simon, a rank one as well. Kirono filled him up with the recent happenings. Kirono asked him if he was going to take up the emergency quest, to which Simon replied that he would rather reject it. But the cancellation fees were so high that he could not afford it. Kirono had a special request for him. He wanted him to make guns, not single-shot ones but the ones that could fire rapidly. Simon did have some ideas, but he only had a week to come up with them. He proposed that the physically difficult parts could be replaced with magic. That way, the gun could be ready in a week. He made the blueprint and showed it to Kirono. The gun project began. At a highway leading to QL, Sao spotted a huge army approaching. Even the entire Sparta army would have to be on their toes, let alone the dragon king of that army. They had even brought Pegasus Knights, which meant that it was a really powerful army. Saus wondered if Kirono really wanted to fight that huge army. Smoke was coming out of Simon's house. Inside, Lily, in her true form, was aiming at Kirono and Simon while they both were hugging each other in utter shock. She warned Kirono to get away from the woman. A few minutes ago, Fiona and Lily had just finished making potions in large numbers, and she wanted Kirono to praise her for her hard work. But she could not find Kirono anywhere in the guild. She asked Moslin for his whereabouts, and he told her that he was following a beautiful elf girl, and that he might have gone to her place. That was enough to infuriate Lily and transform her into her true form. She threatened Moz to tell the truth, and he told her that he was not lying. She left, saying that she would be out for a bit, and that is how she ended up in Simon's room. Kirono assured Lily that Simon was just an adventurer who returned to the village a while ago. Kirono did not know, either, that Simon was a boy. Lily thought that Simon was a spy. But when Kirono told her to read Simon's mind, she realized that Simon was indeed a boy and not a girl. He then explained to her that they were talking about guns, which were a new invention. He explained everything to Lily and told her the best part was that Simon would create a complex weapon that could help them resist the cross army. Back at the guild, when Lily returned, she was welcomed by Fiona, whose mouth and hands were filled with food. She told Fiona that it was all the skeleton old man's stupid understanding. Fiona was good at reading people, and she knew Lily was not okay. Lily went to her room and threw herself in bed. She knew Kirono inside and out, from his voice, scent, warmth, and the sound of his heart, but yet there was one side she did not know, the side that Kirono showed to Simon that day. The excitement, the energy, and the enthusiasm. She was jealous of Simon because, although he did not wield any magic, he attracted Kirono's heart. 
She was strong and beautiful, and she was the one who had the deepest level of trust with Kirono, even though Kirono did not show her that side of him. Five days after the arrival of the Adventure Alliance, everything was going smoothly. The village's fortification was progressing smoothly, and they held practices with whatever time they were left with. Vulcan was practicing, and the retreat horn blew, yet he did not stop. Hirono teased him that the dog ears on his were just for show, and Vulcan yelled that he was a wolf and not a dog. Hirono saw Irina's sister, who was stationed there on guard. He thought that maybe it was to compete with him, but the vigilante corps leader was stationed in the village as well. He thought that he was planning on having half of his subordinates do guard duty, just like Irina's sister. He approached Laura and told her that it did not seem like her boss was helping the refugees, let alone participating in training. She apologized to him and told him that the members of the Vigilante Corps too wanted to help when they had the chance, but their boss always said that that was not their job. She was sorry for shamelessly piling up so much work on him. She promised that she would definitely help during the battle. He told her not to worry as she was stuck with a superior like him, and thus she was helpless. While Kirono and the other adventurers had many worries on their backs, they were still able to somehow finish preparing for the interception. All that was left was to drill the formation into each and every member. He brought Lily and Fiona out in a field and told them that the element master would be doing self-training. He chose the open field because the village might be in danger if they practiced there. That day, their aim was to confirm how strong their full power was. He had never seen them at their full potential, and they would be able to cooperate better if they were familiar with their party members' limits. Fiona said that in that case she would like to first see Kirono's full potential, as he was the leader after all. The practice target was a scarecrow with a cross helmet and drop dead, you cross bastards written on it. Kirono concentrated and used bullet arts, and using full burst, he completely erased the scarecrow. Fiona was not impressed by the attack because there was no explosion, and his attack was just about packing mana and shooting them. She told him that his attack did not have homing ability or any other special ability. It was only magic that scattered dust around. She judged his attack so harshly that it left Kirono mortified. Next up was Lily. She transformed into her real form and used Meteor Strike. A huge crate formed in the ground, leaving both Fiona and Kirono stunned by her capability. Fiona was envious of her control over magic, and Kirono was just in awe. Lily explained that her spell was slow and thus not fit for agile opponents, whereas Kirono's magic was less wasteful and more flexible. It was more convenient against human opponents. Fiona was the last one in the line and she requested that they stand away as it was about to get dangerous. Lily's crater was eclipsed by Fiona's. Her attack was so strong that the nearest guard post rumbled when she attacked. But the drawback was that if she used it once, she would not be able to move for a while. Hirono carried Fiona in her hands, and jealous Lily hopped on his back. That marked the completion of the Element Master's cooperation training. The three happily returned home that day, not knowing that in two days the Cross Army would attack and steal their peace.